Hello and welcome to Talking Open for Climate Justice, a limited run podcast series created by Western Michigan University Libraries. I'm your host, Sarah Volmering, and this week we're shining a light on open access and how it helps foster solutions for some of the greatest challenges facing our planet. To truly understand climate justice, we must develop an interdisciplinary mindset. In our first episode, we learned about climate justice from a sociological perspective, specifically from a criminological point of view. But it's clear that climate justice touches on so many different subjects, from biology, meteorology, and health, to politics and human behavior. Open access makes it possible for anyone to find and use important research on this topic, no matter where they're located, what they're studying, or their ability to pay for access. We'll continue exploring open access and climate justice with today's guest, Dr. Paul Clements. Dr. Clements is a professor of political science at Western Michigan University, where he directs the Masters of International Development Administration Program and the Graduate Certificate Program in Climate Change Policy and Management. Dr. Clements has degrees from Harvard and Princeton, and his work focuses on international development and Rawlsian political analysis including The Ethics of Climate Change and Critical Rawlsian Theory of Climate Justice. And he's the co-founder of Western Michigan University's Climate Change Working Group. Dr. Clements, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Sarah. Today we're talking about climate justice and open access and the intersection between the two. My first question is, what does climate justice mean to you? Yeah, well, you can kind of tell from my publications that I have a lot of interest in John Rawls. He's widely considered the leading political philosopher of the 20th century, and I had the opportunity to take a class with him at Harvard as undergraduate. His general approach is to say, well, if we want to ask about what's going to be just, we should imagine that we don't know who we are. Like, And for climate change, that means if you didn't know where you live in the world, whether you're rich or poor, you know, what your situation was, then what would be your approach to climate change? climate justice. And, you know, I think from that perspective, it's really clear that the harms that climate change is imposing to some extent on people like the United States, but even much more seriously in so many developing countries where they just don't have the support. Um, and, and, and also their governments aren't really in a position to, to help them out the way like right now, the hurricane in Florida. They're going to get massive support afterward. But, you know, when that happens in Bangladesh, the government just doesn't have those resources. So, you know, certainly I think climate justice requires us to try try the best we can for the Paris Agreement target to limit global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. But I think equally important is for adjust for adapting to the harms that, that we really focus on the most vulnerable, the people whose lives are going to be most harmed by this. And then really the piece that's pretty much neglected in the international uh, discussions and, and, and discourse is, is, is climate migrants. And they're probably the most vulnerable people who have to just leave their homes because they get flooded out or there's too much drought, they can't farm anymore. So I think these are sort of the three areas is effective mitigation, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and then adaptation. And they're really, because the planning takes a lot of forward looking, most countries are not very good at it, <laughs> but it, we need to focus particularly on those who are most vulnerable. And then the third area is, is really climate migrants. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, released in 2022, indicated that 143 million people are likely to be uprooted over the next 30 years by extreme weather and other disasters, according to reporting from the Associated Press. Drought, flooding, Rising temperatures, crop failure, and other natural disasters are just a few of the factors that could force people to leave their homes for safer places. If extreme weather events increase in frequency and places become unlivable, we may see an increase in climate migrants and refugees. You know, right now, if you you know can't stay in your home country, you have to leave your home country and you come into, let's say, United States or Europe or someplace, you're just treated as an economic migrant you know, and you're just, you know, thrown out or whatever. So it's a pretty tough situation right now. What do you think influenced your perspective on climate justice? Sure. Well, I mentioned, I actually took a class with Rawls as an undergraduate. So I was familiar with his broad approach to justice, you know, from early days. But then I was a Peace Corps volunteer 
in the Gambia in West Africa, and I stayed on afterwards for a few more years. And this was back in the late 1980s. And already in the Gambia, there were the Sahel was expanding, and the villages that were the most inland, closest to the, the Sahel, were, people were already having to abandon them because they couldn't farm anymore because there just wasn't enough rain. And it was that was when we first had the um, like Newsweek and you know prominent stories about climate change. You know, I think when Al Gore went, went and talked to Congress back in '88, and so. You know, we didn't, I, I, I knew that it wasn't clear at that time if like these particular villages were specifically affected by climate change, but the broad impact of climate change was going to be, was very clear at that time. But I thought that, okay, you know, we're, we're paying attention to this, that then 1992 came around and there was a UN framework commission, a convention on climate change. And it, and it said committed to, you know, make sure that we deal with this. I thought, you know, our governments, they're going to take care of this. This is, you know, so dangerous. Surely they're going to do the right thing. They didn't. <laughs> We've just seen it getting worse and worse. What action has been happening over the past few decades? The, the biggest block historically, and if you look at the historical development, was when, you know, after 92 with the Framework Convention, it took them five years to come up with the Kyoto Protocol, the first international agreement. And that would have moved forward except that the U.S. Senate said they had said no way. And here we are, United States, the biggest historical greenhouse gas emitter, our historical polluter, and our Senate is saying, no, we're not going to participate unless at that time the developing countries' governments did. So then it took until 2015, so many years, and just everything kept on getting worse in between. So I think we Americans have a particular responsibility. That seems pretty clear. And there's such a wide variety of mindsets about climate change in the U.S. that probably makes it difficult to gain traction. Yeah. No, I mean, it's sort of a sad thing in the United States is that um, the the fossil fuel companies and basically a lot of millionaires who made their millions off of, off of coal and, and oil, they've been playing the political game for a long time. And they, they know how to use their money to protect their profits basically in Congress by essentially buying off politicians, which we call it campaign contributions. Um, but then also they, by the, by the late eighties, early nineties, they, they were figuring this out that they were going to, if they were going to keep on, you know, making billions and billions in profits that they had to really try to try to, well, what we saw is, is to confuse the American people. And when you talk about climate science denial, climate change denial, it's not just something that just happened by itself because it's complicated. It's, it was actually a, a, a carefully planned strategy by the, by, by the oil interests, by the, by the billionaires and others, the big companies. They put millions and millions of dollars to confuse the American public. And they used the same techniques that the, that the um, t- tobacco industry had used a few decades earlier to to sort of confuse people about cancer from tobacco, which you, you remember worked for about 20 years, right? So it's, it's, um, it's kind of a sad history. Are we starting to see more awareness about climate change or climate justice in the U.S.? Yeah, no, definitely here in the United States, the majority now definitely see this as an issue. Part of the, the challenge is that, that here, again, here in the United States, it's not as, as high of a political priority like a lot of people will put it maybe fifth or sixth on their list compared to, let's say, in Europe, where they'll put it maybe like first or second or third. <laughs> and then the other thing is that that most Americans, and we have really powerful environmental organizations, but our environmental organizations are mostly focusing at the U.S. level. Like, you know, and, and we need this. You know, I'm not, I'm not against that. Of course, I'm all for it in terms of getting the United States, you know, to, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But the reality is that it's the international negotiations with the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, like the Paris Agreement and the meetings they're continuing to have every year. That's where the real policy gets set. And that's where they're not yet, you know, right now, if a country exceeds their commitment to reduce greenhouse gases, nothing happens. And, and so there's no, there's no real hard budget. And, and, and right now there's, there's simply they're supposed to be putting $100 billion a year into, for the, the rich countries helping the, the developing countries with mitigation and adaptation. But number one, they're not doing that. 
a number that's only coming up to maybe 80 billion or so a year, um, but which is not nearly enough. But more particularly, they let's say if that's 80 billion dollars, maybe 50 billion is going to mitigation, 30 billion is going to adaptation, and they have only 14 people working on climate migrants. The 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 international negotiations, the advanced countries just don't want to talk about climate migrants because if they do, if they get it, if they allow that to, to sort of be central in the discussion, then they'll have to take some responsibility and they don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. I mean, U.S. government doesn't want to do that. So that's, that's I think, a really, again, fundamental climate justice issue. How did you get interested in climate justice? You mentioned your experience in the Peace Corps in Africa. Was that the start for you? That was where it was brought home to me the real consequences for people when they like lose their homes because you just can't farm anymore. Um, but also, I've, I've been interested in international development. I actually grew up in Hong Kong and India. So even when I started college, like I would say, okay, I want to work on international development. And it's become increasingly clear that even though like global poverty has been going down for 30 some years up until about five years ago, and like developing countries were mostly, for the most part, moving in the right direction. But now climate change threatens to turn that around for so many countries. And so this has been, you know, central to my professional career, right. international development. And so you, so climate change has to be central to it. I'm teaching, you know, you mentioned I, I direct this master's program in international development administration. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that for my students, the biggest issue, uh, development issue in their future it's going to be climate change, and it's going to affect the developing countries more severely than the, mo the majority of Americans. What do you think are the biggest challenges in the climate justice movement? Well, I mean, again, um, uh, part of it is that there has been this really systematic, well, politically well-organized opposition to climate action from the, from the carbon interests, the people who profit, like at, at very high levels. Um, and I think the climate justice movement hasn't really developed the sort of strategic uh, opposition, like countering, because the, the oil interests, they're politically smart, <laughs> um, and they know how this game is played. And where this becomes most clear is that, the, as I mentioned before, the environmental organizations, you know, we mostly focus on, well, what can you and I do? How can we reduce our carbon emissions? What can our city do, our state, and even, even our country? All those are really important. But they're not addressing the international negotiations, which is where the real policy gets set. And so the, the climate justice organizations need to basically up their game. And I, I appreciate that, you know, this is a, this is a complicated issue and, and it's hard for people to get their minds around how the international negotiations work. You know, a lot of times the harms are going to be a long way in the future. And, you know, politically, it's just difficult to, 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 to deal with those kind of things, but we've got to do it. Thinking about the international element of climate justice, what role do you think free and open access to research and data plays in the climate justice movement internationally? You know, open access is so important that climate change, as you say, it affects everybody. Um, and it is a complicated issue. And, you know, I appreciate that you don't expect, like, the majority of the population to really dig into it, right? But whenever someone does want to dig into it, they need to be able to get in, get, get the analysis that is out there. And so, um, you know, when I've published on this, even when I've had to pay it out of my own pocket, I've done that because I want my work on climate justice to be something that anyone in the world can read. And, and, and I'm not just me. I think that all of this work, it's really important because, because the effects of climate change are on everybody that, that everyone, you know, if they have the interest, shouldn't be blocked from understanding it. So open access, that's, that's so important. Do you think that having open access research makes a difference to governments, researchers, and educators living in developing countries? Exactly. Because, you know, here in the United States, you know, here at Western, if I don't, if I can't get an article, I can get an ILL and it'll show up, you know, usually in, a, in, in two or three days, if, if that, mm -hmm. right? But, but so many people, and I've, and I've talked to colleagues in developing countries and their library, they, they don't have the agreements and they can't afford to, you know, pay for all these articles. And so they, they just can't read it if it's not open access. Um, and again, you know, it's their governments 
that need to be making the big investments and, and making the big changes in terms of figuring out how to deal with the drought, how to deal with the, the stronger hurricanes and, and the sea level rise and, and, and all these things. And um, if you can't read the research, then obviously that's a big block. So, so open access is so important for that. So when you think about you know, the movement towards climate justice or on climate justice, is there anything in particular that gives you hope? Well, we certainly see the younger generation just is so, in, so many people, so our students here at Western are so engaged in this. Our student governments, both of the undergraduate and graduate, they've made this a real priority. The younger generation's interest is really, is really fundamental. And again, just the way public opinion and the general awareness is getting so much stronger now. Um, but I then have to come back to the issue that, that that's getting people to, to take a lot of local action and that local action is important. But to get the, the fundamental changes, we need a hard carbon budget globally. If you break your budget, then you have real consequences. And, and that's only going to happen in the international negotiations. And we need much more effective support for adaptation, particularly in the developing countries. And this is, it's well known that, that the international institutions are just completely inadequate on adaptation today. And then they're not even, it's not well known. People don't even understand. They don't see the neglect of climate migrants in, in the international system. Most people don't. Dealing with a problem by sticking your head in the sand isn't very effective. You know, it's actually going to be better for everyone if climate migrants can be uh, productively integrated in society rather than treated as, you know, outcasts. What's your experience been like working with students on this issue? Look, I'm teaching two graduate classes right now, and they both focus on aspects of climate change. <laughs> and the students are so engaged. Both classes have um, almost all the students are from developing countries, and they see that this is, you know, going to affect the well-being of their fellow citizens. And, you know, if it's not dealt with, we're talking, we could talk about literally millions of people being killed and that their positive movement, you know, in, in terms of their development um, moving forward, turning around and going backward in some cases because of climate change. And so, so they're very engaged. It sounds like there are people from many different disciplines involved in this work. Would you say that the interdisciplinary focus is a part of working towards climate justice? It definitely is. And it's, it's, it's in the sciences, it's in the humanities, in the business school, um, uh, in engineering, of course, that, that climate change affects every single discipline. You know, it's, it's, it's an inspiration to me that we have so many of our faculty who are really coming to grips with this in their teaching and in their, their research, and that we have uh, these discussions um, that we're working together for this working group just to make this happen. You know, and so I feel, hey, we're doing our thing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for listening to Talking Open for Climate Justice, a podcast created by Western Michigan University Libraries for International Open Access Week. For more information about open access, visit our website, wmich.edu slash library slash open hyphen access.